hello, Evan. Thank you for joining us today on uh, the ARCA Fireside Chat Series around ESG. Great to be here, Rain. Thanks for having me. Terrific. Um, if you wouldn't mind, would you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how NASDAQ is looking at uh, ESG? Yeah, so I've been at the exchange for 20 years or so, and uh, NASDAQ has been involved in ESG in one way, shape, or form for all of that time. But really, exchange participation, especially major exchange participation, ramped up about 10 years ago, around 2010. That's when NASDAQ launched its Green Index family. That's when there were two parallel working groups uh, formed around the world, one at the United Nations Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, another one a few years later in our trade association called the Sustainability Working Group. And they're both basically working towards the same thing, which is how can we ensure that investors in particular have the information that they need to make long-term decisions about companies? And how can we simultaneously train companies to disclose information that may or may not be in the balance sheet or in the 10K or the 10Q in a way that makes sense for those investors that have a particular uh, lens. And that lens might be environmental, it could be social, it could be governance, it could be anything that's not traditionally serviced by the, the reporting structure that's in place. Um, and over the last 10 years, we've worked with just about every uh, partner in the space to try to create a common sense middle ground between investors and companies on ESG. So we've been part of the UN Global Compact. We've been part of formal stakeholder councils or the board of uh, SASB and GRI and reporting standards boards. We have put out an ESG reporting guide to our listed companies to help make the business case for ESG reporting, why even in a voluntary market, it still matters that you put this information out there. Um, and then, you know, it won't be a surprise to you, Rain, but we, it's, there's been an explosion of products and services in this space over, the, over that time, too. So after the Green Index family, there's an, a ton of NASDAQ innovation around ETFs and bonds and corporate services and uh, IR advisory teams and board tools and data. And I'm sure we'll get into some of this, but it's a burgeoning market that seems to show no signs of stopping. And as we move towards... Um, uh, sort of mainstream of these topics in the investment spectrum. Uh, it's creating all kinds of interesting opportunity in the space. That's fascinating. Um, as you know, uh, Arca is a asset manager that focuses on digital assets and we're taking uh, a view around ESG and really just trying to engage um, folks to think you know, broadly about it, not taking one particular stance whether uh, digital assets are good ESG or not. Um, how does uh, NASDAQ's efforts in ESG overlap with digital assets? And are you seeing uh, activity there? Uh, in lots of ways. Um, in the innovation space, there's certainly a lot of innovation around digital assets coming from the exchange. So if you think about ESG uh, generally, uh, the focus in the past has been on the E, the environmental side is really the origin story of ESG and still in some ways the beating heart of this investment movement with the, with the climate change and uh, 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 initiatives that are in place. But now we're finding that the S and the G are, they always were just as important, but now they're just as prominent. And we're finding that in the digital asset space too, but also throughout all of ESG. So I think there's a couple of ways to think about ESG and digital assets before I talk about what NASDAQ's doing. I mean, I think that first and foremost, there's a good and a bad side to everything. On the bad side, digital, uh, digital asset making doesn't always mean clean and green as we have seen. Um, there's opportunity potentially for social exploitation in crypto and other places. So we have to look at the whole picture when we start to talk about asset classes and what the advantages are. But I think the good far outweigh the bad. And some of the good things around uh, the intersection between ESG and digital assets, uh, off the top of my head, um, innovation, certainly a lot of innovation driven by technology. You do have a different and perhaps more robust governance control structure via uh, uh, digital ledger technology and distributed ledgers. Um, you can create more efficient markets, more efficient information uh, disclosure and transmission between buyers and sellers. You certainly can broaden the access to the market using these tools. Um, and I think that there's a way that you could argue that you're building more trust into transactions with technology via these uh, new asset classes that are emerging. And ESG is a part of their story, both on the pro and the con side, but I think almost overwhelmingly on the pro side. 
And then NASDAQ, you know, we have certainly looked at this and we have been a player in this space for a long time. Um, you know, we have a digital asset suite, which is, you know, focuses on everything from issuance to, um, uh, to matching, to settlement, to custody, making all of that really seamless and efficient through, through digital platforms. Um, we have a sustainable bond network, which is built on a DLT platform. Um, so there's lots of ways where we have looked at the intersection in our own business between ESG and the rise of digital asset space. That's really fascinating. And it's really interesting to see that you're thinking about um, them in the same way as us, um, or at least roughly, um, you know, with some real interesting things going around uh, the G and the S on ESG. Um, you mentioned, you know, E has been the beating heart, you know, carbon footprint, sustainability of the ESG moment. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of the conversations in digital assets around the E portion of your uh, approach at NASDAQ, which is kind of this holistic approach of getting people to think of all sides. How is that being received? Is it, are people still still focusing on the E and the G and the S or the afterthought or where are those uh, discussions or how people are looking at it? Um, I think it's a little bit all over the map right now because there's just so much demand or there's, there's servicing of the segment that comes in many different forms. Um, I think that certainly over the last year and a half, we've seen the, the pandemic and uh, social crises and political crises that have focused issue uh, issuance uh, into the S and focused attention onto the S part of ESG more so than before. And I think investors are looking at that as a signal of long-term uh, stability and value. Um, you know, disclosure, which in the ESG space traditionally has been sort of a roadblock. You know, there is no standard harmonized framework for disclosure. There are a few, I would argue, a manageable few. But, you know, that's always been a problem with the, uh, with the disclosure space around, you know, what metrics do we disclose? What do investors need to know? How much transparency should there be? I think it's now more of a workaround than a roadblock that uh, that seems to be the case. Uh, we're seeing increasing pressure on supply chains. And we always knew that this was going to be part of the issue around the emergence of ESG. I think you're seeing it with the efficiency play of, of uh, distributed ledger, you know, supply chains are much more transparent. You can actually dig further into the supply chain, supplier of suppliers to try to see where the responsibility boundaries for a company or other uh, uh, issuers might lie. And then you're certainly seeing regulation. Regulation is coming from all parts of the world. There are clear signals that it is coming in the U.S. market as well, too, not only around digital assets. I mean, there's been uh, talk about that, but really around ESG disclosure generally, trying to um, create a, an environment, a transactional environment where buyers and sellers have access to the same information in the same way at the same time, and they can make smart decisions based on it. So I think those four things are certainly trending right now. And um, I see no slowdown in the digital asset space when you've got something that's, that's so fast to market and so scalable and um, you know, interoperable with all these different systems, um, there's just going to be more innovation there. That's fascinating. Um, and I agree with uh, really everything you're saying broadly. Um, when you talk, when we talk about um, these ESG components um, in digital assets and engaging with them in this thoughtful way, um, are your clients and the people uh, that are coming to NASDAQ for information exchange marketplace, are they, are they, are they, is this idea resonating with them um, that digital assets are this broad spectrum of ESG components, and is that idea really having traction? It is, and we see it. We see it in a couple of ways. I mean, we have lots of lots of marketplaces around the world that leverage the digital asset suite that Nasdaq put together to try to create this ecosystem around uh, issuance and, and and matching and trading and settlement. I mean, that's all happening. But then, you know, all of the innovative steps that we've taken with particular products are finding lots of um, take up in the market. You know. NASDAQ made this investment in a company called Puro.Earth, which is essentially a, a carbon removal certification market. It turns carbon removal into certificates, which are essentially tradable digital assets that are verified and that are transparent. They have got, they're built on the blockchain. And so you've got this emerging market around carbon removal that didn't exist 10 years ago. And the technology to power it didn't exist in a way that it does now. Uh, so, I mean, and there's, amazing amounts of excitement around around that particular innovation and then 
you know, even the things that we do in the informational space, the sustainable bond network, which is also built on DLT and smart contracts, it's really just bringing its information connection for, between uh, different stakeholders on bonds. Uh, you can tag bonds by sustainable development goals from the UN. You can, uh, any sort of investment lens that you have, you can leverage this digital platform in order to create more um, understanding and insight over the long term. So I, I hate to say that, you know, everything we're throwing out there in the space seems to be getting traction, but it that is sort of the case. People are thirsty for innovation. They're looking for more asset classes. They're looking for innovative ways to channel their capital into more sustainable directions. And I think that that story around digital assets has certainly been evolving. That's that's fascinating. And when you think about it, really, I know you say you're loath to say that the efforts that you're making are gaining traction, um, but it, it is a high class problem. But it also makes sense um, that NASDAQ as a global market, also as a center of information and where people look for the trusted exchange of information, it would be natural that those synergies um, actually exist. Where do you think you guys are um, when you look at your peer group of other exchanges and people that look like you in the embracing of digital assets, especially as it concerns uh, ESG? Well, let me divide it into two parts. Uh, on ESG, I think we're clearly in the, in the leading edge. Uh, NASDAQ has been a leader in terms of the voluntary disclosure of ESG data from companies to investors and frankly to other uh, stakeholders in the spectrum for a number of years. And in many ways in the industry, in the exchange industry, we've been a leader in sort of creating that norm around disclosure long before and even unless the regulator has compelled us to do so. So there, that's number one, just because we believe that it creates a more efficient market. We believe that it creates more value for investors. We believe that it creates a different kind of investment uh, style, which is a long-term buy and hold style. It's a, it is a move towards um, a, a different time horizon in how we make investments uh, in particular places. So that's number one. Uh, in terms of digital assets, I would say that we're also leading edge too. And that's mostly because you have to know the NASDAQ story. NASDAQ is built on this digital, digital exchange technology, this digital exchange idea that machines can be more efficient and more transparent and more verifiable and you, depending on who you talk to, more trustworthy than um, other systems in terms of connecting buyers and sellers. So we have this network that was grown out of this idea that NASDAQ built for 50 years that an electronically traded uh, uh, exchange is an efficient and, and futuristic way to go. And we have been servicing and providing that kind of market technology around the world to most stock exchanges for, for many years now. So there's a sort of built-in ecosystem for our technology and digital assets through the asset suite or other, other places, are, they, they, they fit there easily. And there's not a, a difficult process to kind of move into different asset classes because the NASDAQ market technology structure is already in place most places around the world. That, that makes complete sense. Um, when we talk about, it's fascinating. Um, I, it's now that I think about it that you guys have been doing this for so long, um, and, and like you say, voluntarily, um, even pre-regulatory, uh, a drive on this just through mission and desire. What do you think in a world that's kind of now swamped with ESG investing? alternatives, everything's ESG now. And now that the yeah. asset management uh, industry has identified this as a desirable trait, uh, everything is ESG. What do you think um, would be most helpful, especially from your guys, what you can bring uh, value-wise to the ecosystem that would allow investors to make better ESG uh, decisions? You know, People want their investment dollars to actually impact, not just check a box. So kind of what structures around that? And then specifically, how do you think um, those things overlay to digital assets? Uh, I think they are related because I think we're seeing the convergence of innovation in those two areas. Um, a few things come to mind and we talked about this beforehand, so I have thought about this. Uh, um, I think there has to be, on the e-side, you can't ignore it entirely. There has to be a net zero environmental story on all of these products and services. There's gotta be a way that we create, manage, 
trade and settle these instruments that doesn't necessarily make the environmental picture worse. So it's got to be neutral or, or net negative over time. And that's the entire uh, value chain from creation through, uh, through settlement. That's got to be the case. Um, I think that information exchange has got to be uh, more symmetrical. You can't have certain data in the hands of a, of a, of a privileged few. You've got to have equal access to data and the same timeline and access of access to that data so that all investors can make smart and informed decisions, whether they're going to leverage ESG principles or not, um, whether they're going to particularly invest in a digital asset or not. They need to have all the information necessary to make that choice. So that's just efficient market making and and fair and equitable market making. We, we're big believers in that, of course. And then whatever assets that we, we either have now that are emerging or that may be created in the future, you said the word trust a couple of times, and I think that's a huge part of this story. Uh, assets need to be verifiable. They need to be stable. They need to be trusted and transparent. I think that DLT and the digital assets framework can and will be um, exemplars of those uh, uh, qualities. Um, but I think that we need investors to see the same thing there and to buy into it in the same way. There's a certain amount of skepticism around ESG and digital assets. There's a certain amount of, and I think that some of that skepticism is, is well-earned, um, but I think that clearly we're emerging into a different era here where this is a solution more than a problem. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, what do you think, um, this is really, I mean, you guys are so innovative in this space right now. And really, I, I can honestly say ahead of the game, what do you think is next, um, if you can share um, for NASDAQ um, over the near and kind of midterm in driving for these kind of this mission of giving investors this, you know, better frameworks for making these ESG decisions? What does what the near and more future, longer term future look like? Uh, for you guys offerings yeah i mean and i'll i'll stay away from offerings i'll focus on esg in the marketplace generally um i think that there's clearly a data problem still in the esg landscape um there's a lot of data out there a lot of it is unverified a lot of it is unaudited a lot of it is questionable if not you know somewhat deceptive so we need to look and trying to find ways to standardize that data it it is a bit of a fool's errand to try to find one gold standard that will fix every problem, but we can narrow it down to a few key metrics that actually have meaning and that are, are trackable over time and trendable over time. Um, there's a lot of great and informative ESG metrics in the spectrum. If you look at the Bloomberg terminal, for example, there's hundreds of potential ESG metrics. And for particular investors, they might have a, 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 a value that uh, is um, important to them and to their strategy. But I think there's a mainstream story here around a handful of these metrics that are really driving engagement and progress. And that's what we try to do with our ESG reporting guide. We try to make the case for a handful. We try to make the case that there is a middle ground between this overwhelming amount of data that investors are asking for and the bare minimum or the legally required minimum that companies are, are generally willing to provide. So there's got to be some happy medium there that we're help, helping to establish. And as, a, as an exchange, as a market, I feel like that's where we sit. We sit in that nexus between uh, the investor and the company and uh, the regulator uh, in terms of being the common sense voice uh, and making an efficient market. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that the data problem has to be solved before we can make much more progress. We have to try to find ways to compare apples to apples in the investment space, whether that's a traditional asset or an emerging asset. Fantastic. Um, we recently published our paper on ESG, just trying to encourage um, just engagement with these principles in a, a more thoughtful way and not just checking a letter. I'm glad you saw it. Um, is there any place or any material uh, that we could drive um, people that see this to to see your thoughts um, on ESG or, or how NASDAQ uh, engages with these ideas? Oh, tons. Yeah. I mean, I, I point you first and foremost to that ESG reporting guide, which is available online. We do a version every couple of years. There's a new version coming out this year. It is basically the playbook that we put out there for companies, the public companies that list on NASDAQ uh, to talk about and engage on ESG with uh, stakeholders, mostly investors uh, in lots of different ways. So I would point people there. Our own sustainability report, we try to walk the talk, our own sustainability report, our scores, our ESG rankings and ratings, much of that uh, uh, stuff is public. So you could always go there and see, you know, we report what we believe 
And we try to, without uh, compelling companies to do likewise, to try to make the case that this is reasonable and um, useful, business useful for us to do so. So I'd point people there. Um, you know, as regulation emerges, you know, we are on the record in a number of those efforts. And, um, you know, we often are called to uh, comment or testify as, as rulemaking is, comes into play. You might have heard, this is a very timely conversation. We just had SEC approval on a, a board diversity uh, rule, which our transparency rule, which basically states that if you're listed on our market, you have to have a, a story around your board diversity and or um, uh, disclose, you know, the diversity characteristics of at least two board members. So there's lots of public comment around that, especially in the last few days. So um, you can see that, you know, we're on the record in a number of places. We're trying to find ways to mostly create market-driven solutions uh, where businesses come to the understanding that this is good business on their own, um, but, you know, not afraid to leverage rulemaking uh, with a light touch when necessary. We are very sensitive to the burden that companies face when it comes to disclosure. And so um, we're trying to find smart ways to put more information and comparable data into the ecosystem rather than, you know, just unilaterally declare this is worthwhile or, or this is not. Well, I, I commend your guys' approach. I don't think that there's anything more in line with really the digital asset ecosystem and kind of distributed decision making than the idea of market driven approaches to these things. I think that, that philosophically that is aligned, you know, democratically letting the market choose and hopefully these outcomes um, rise to the top because they are the best. And really that's that's been the proposition of ESG this entire time. It's not just uh, an idea for an idea's sake, that these lead for better long-term outcomes um, that encourage more long-term thinking um, and are beneficial in many uh, different ways, not just in some sort of nebulous goal sense, but also you know, better economic uh, terms as well. 100% agree. That's been our position all along. It's been my job for the last 10 years, making the business case for this. This is what we believe in, in terms of uh, how we engage with uh, people that are part of the market and the advice when asked that we give to people that, that want to know more. So um, we're a big believer in uh, the concept of material disclosure and market-driven solutions in creating a, a dynamic between uh, buyers and sellers that is fair and uh, achievable. Uh, and to me, ESG is, is absolutely the crest of that wave. Oh, fantastic. Evan, this has really been a, a fantastic discussion. I think that's a perfect place to talk at that big um, uh, message of where we all align. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I look forward to talking to you in the future. It's been a pleasure, Rain. Thanks for having me.